Hypothalamus is a phylogenetically ancient structure. It is the structure which evolved in vertebrates to control hormone release. And in us, it is centralized around controlling rele hormone release from the pituitary. We will also see here, and, and, and you're going to learn about how the hypothalamus controls uh, the pituitary, which is arguably a piece of, of endocrinology. What, you're, what we're going to focus our efforts on is not so much hypothalamo pituitary uh, control, but in fact, the way that the hypothalamus control of pituitary is, um, is part coordinated with how we control actual behavior. Okay? So let's, let's just take a look at the general approach that is taken. This is a mid sagittal section through the, uh, th through the brain, and you see the hypothalamus, which is just the ventral part of the diencephalon. And there is a connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary through the median eminence, which, as you recall, sits just caudal to the optic chiasm. And that's very important. It's very important because the pituitary has um, the, the penchant for developing uh, uncontrolled gr growth. So there are pituitary tumors called pituitary adenomas. And they can be either space occupying or secreting or both. If they, uh, if they grow in size, they will, impact, they will impinge on the optic chiasm and the result will be a uh, interruption of normal vision. And we're going to look at that because this is something you have to know. It happens. Um, and uh, be, besides the fact that it happens, it is always tested. So it is tested on step one. This is one of those things you have to know. OK. So that, that's the phylogenetically conserved purpose of the hypothalamus. But it is not the beauty of the hypothalamus. The beauty of the hypothalamus is that the hypothalamus also has connections down to the spinal cord and brainstem to motor outputs, to motor neurons or motor interneurons, neurons that then synapse themselves onto, onto motor neurons. Um, it also has control, it also has projections into autonomic outflow areas parasympathetic and sympathetic outflow areas. And it also has connections up to the telencephalon. And so what can happen by activity in the hypothalamus is that not only you get a hormone release, but you also get a change in telencephalic function, in cognition, that can lead to a change in your emotional state and change in your motivational state. I feel like laying on the couch all day versus, oh, I got to go get a drink of water because I'm really thirsty. Uh, it can uh, change your, uh, your cutaneous, uh, I'm sorry, it can, can t change your, uh, your autonomic or automatic control. So for example, if your cold thermoregulation is something that is controlled by, uh, is ma has the master control in the hypothalamus. And so if, if the individual is cold, there will be uh, vasoconstriction of the cutaneous uh, uh, vessels, whereas the, if the individual is hot, there will be sweating. Um, and finally, uh, there is behavior, not just auto autonomic outflow, such as sweating and, and um, vasoconstriction or, va or relaxation of vasoconstriction, but actual beha behavior. So if you go outside and you see a squirrel in the middle of summer, that squirrel it, it, here in Chicago where it's over 90 degrees is splayed out. It has the most surface area that it can possibly make so that it can lose as much heat as it possibly can to the environment. In contrast, if you see that same squirrel in the middle of winter, it's huddled up. It's conserving its heat. It is not exposing surface area. It is making itself as small as possible to lose as little as, as possible uh, to the environment. We have the same uh, circuits. We have the same uh, uh, instincts, essentially. Um, on top of those, we have some additional ones. Uh, not only do we uh, access our telencephalon to change our mood or our motivation or affect, but we can also make some 
uh, logical choices, such as putting on a coat in winter and wearing uh, a sleeveless shirt in, in summer. Okay. So, uh, as I said, the hypothalamus is uh, connected to the uh, pituitary. You need to learn this, but uh, I would, I, I, my hunch has always been that this is taught uh, better than I could possibly teach it in, in endocrinology. Uh, suffice it to say that there are two different types of uh, control, one of the non-neural pituitary in the, in the anterior part and one of the neural pituitary in the posterior part. Um, the uh, control of the neural pituitary is through two very important peptides, oxytocin and vasopressin, and we'll look a little bit more at these. We'll, do, we'll go into the hypothalamic function a lot more when we talk about homeostasis uh, towards the end of the course. One of the critical, uh, the critical take-home message for the control of the pituitary by the hypothalamus is that you have to understand that there is a HPA axis, a hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal axis, whereas the hypothalamus releases hormones. It releases all manner of hormones, such as uh, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, growth uh, hormone, uh, and so on. But one of the ones is corticotropin-releasing hormone. And corticotropin-releasing hormone acts on the anterior pituitary, the non-neural pituitary, to uh, elicit uh, ACTH release from the, from the pituitary, from the anterior pituitary, which then in turn acts on the adrenal gland to release cortisol, okay? And so it is this release of cortisol that serves as the response, the, the global response to stress. This organizes lots of stress, um, uh, advantageous responses in response to stress. So for example, uh, this will um, shift the energy expenditure of the body from say, mounting antibody, mounting, mounting an immune response and shift it over to more active escape, fight type of, of activities. Um, so cortisol is, is absolutely necessary. We'll, we'll look at this before, but if you had a choice between having no cortisol and having too much cortisol, even though having too much cortisol is a problem, you would choose no, uh, having too much cortisol. Having no cortisol, despite the fact that stress is a, uh, is a bad word these days, having no cortisol, having no stress response is lethal, is potentially lethal. We need to have a system that enables us to respond to challenges of, of life. And through evolutionary time, um, I can assure you, animals, including mammals, uh, encountered uh, stressful situations and needed to mount a response. And the hypothalamus and the HPA axis in particular is critical to mounting a, a successful response to stressful situations. Okay, so um, one place where this kind of coordinated uh, response is, is most uh, evident is in uh, lactation. And here is a woman uh, who is nursing her baby. Now, there is a release of uh, prolactin and, and oxytocin during this situation, which are, are released um, in response to the baby, baby's, uh, the somatosensory input from the baby sucking on the nipple. So that returns back to mom, to her hypothalamus, and the release of oxytocin and, and, and prolactin are gonna have both peripheral effects. So for example, prolactin is uh, important for milk letdown. Uh, and so that's a, that's a really uh, simple, straightforward effect, but it also has effects on her mood and affect. And so for example, the release of oxytocin within the central nervous system, it acts as though it's a chill pill. It it's acts as though this uh, individual took a, a, a benzodiazepine such as a Valium um, or a Xanax. And so now things that would bother this individual normally are no longer bothersome. And the beauty of that is that uh, I don't think that it's that easy to, to nurse a baby when you're uptight and really stressed out. So to be able to dial down stress 
and dial down the affective uh, response to stress is very conducive to successful nursing. And that's the type of integrated uh, packaging that the hypothalamus is responsible for. So now that we've uh, looked at the hypothalamus, before we look at the dorsal thalamus, we're gonna look at the, uh, at the rest of the structures, the non-cortical structures in the telencephalon. <music>